So how organisms, not just microorganisms, but all organisms, but it relates to the microorganisms also, right? How organisms obtain nutrients, right? And so I've got three images here, right? And so this is a mushroom. It's known as a stinkhorn, right? And it typically shows up in the early parts of spring, and then it shows up toward um, around the middle to late fall, and then they go dormant, right? This is the underneath, under, underside of a leaf, right? And this is a stoma. It's the way that gases are exchanged. So uh, plants take in CO2 and they release oxygen, right? And then you can see, of course, this is a tiger and the tiger has taken down a water buffalo and it's now having lunch, okay? So when we think about these, there are really two different ways that organisms acquire nutrients. And that those terms are called autotrophic and heterotrophic. As a subgroup underneath heterotroph, and this should be moved over a little bit, uh, there's the term saprophytic or saprobic. Okay, so let's talk about these things. How many people have heard of heterotrophic, autotrophic before? Of the of a very small population. Okay, <laughs> Jessica, tell me, what is it? Uh, well, hetero is the same, right? So hetero I've, I've means hetero like, means different. Okay. Oh, that's right. Homo means same. Hetero is yeah. different. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And then auto means self, right? So trophic, Jessica and everybody else. Trophic means to feed. Auto means self to feed. So these organisms can produce their own nutrients, right? And so these are all the plants, everything that undergoes photosynthesis. There is a misconception out there. A lot of people will say, this: the plants use photosynthesis to create energy. And that's not true. The plants use photosynthesis to create carbohydrates, sugar. Okay, everybody with me? And then they have to undergo cellular respiration in order to produce ATP. All right. Now, heterotrophic, trophic meaning to feed, hetero means you have to consume something else in order to get your nutrients. Okay. So here, if you're a heterotroph, you have to consume something else, right? That it's either living, was once living, or has now been processed and made into a grain like flour or cornmeal or whatever, right? But all those things were something that was once living. And so if that's the case, you have to consume something else. So hetero means you need something something else, some other organism. You have to consume some other organism. Okay. Underneath heterotroph is the term saprophyte or saprophytic or saprobic. They mean the same thing. And these are a special type of heterotrophs. But these organisms that are saprophytic, saprobic, only consume decaying organisms, right? So if you think about that, they're going to be interested in really the recycling of nutrients, right? And on this earth, everything is in balance. And you have rebirth of lots of different things happen every spring. And then you have the going into dormancy happening in the fall which is happening already. I don't know if you feel it, but there is a change in the air already. It's cooling down a little bit. The mornings are a little bit cooler. The leaves are beginning to fall from the pecan trees, right? Those are the first ones that lose their leaves. Um, and then, so pretty soon the leaves are gonna start falling. All those leaves that fall onto the, the ground are going to be broken apart into simple nutrients by everything that's saprophytic. Okay, everybody with me? Because they are no longer are doing what the tree, the, the tissues, the organs of the tree are no longer doing um, what they're intended to do, go undergo photosynthesis, right? What they're doing is now they've lost their color, right? They, they've turned a different color. They've fallen to the ground. And some of them are going to be put into the lakes or the streams or whatever, and they're going to be broken down by the microbes. And then they're going to feed 
the environment, right? Everything that dies feeds the environment so that there can be more growth and more rebirth during the spring. Everything is in balance, okay? So I have three different organisms here. I think you all can appreciate that the middle one, the, the underside, underside of the leaf is that stoma where gas exchange happens, but these are organisms that are autotrophic, right? I think everybody can see that the tiger that has taken down the water buffalo is now consuming that water buffalo um, before it was alive and now it uh, its tissues are still pretty vascularized, right? There, there is a lot of, you know, every single cell in the body doesn't die at once, right? So some continue to undergo cellular respiration even when you die. So this is a pretty nice vascular animal that the that the tiger is consuming, right? Heterotroph. And then that particular example of a mushroom, that's a stinkhorn. And a stinkhorn emits an odor like poo. And so therefore the flies and the beetles are attracted to it. They land on it and they find out there's no lunch here. And just about when they leave, it's done exactly what the mushroom wanted it to do. It crawled around on its reproductive structures. It's picked up the spores, and now it's taken those spores off someplace else, and it's going to drop those spores off wherever it lands, whether it's on your taco or on the ground somewhere or on some poo somewhere else, and it's going to drop those spores off. And therefore, you can have different colonies of these mushrooms that will propagate, that will start to grow in all these different environments, right? That's the way nature has intended it to happen, right? Are there any questions about how organisms acquire nutrients? So mushroom is autotrophic? No, mushrooms are saprophytic. Oh, I got it. Thank you. All right, Keon. Okay. Hey, so let's talk about that for a minute, Keon. You like mushrooms? Do you like mushrooms on your pizza or whatever food you eat? I do. do. you like mushrooms? Yeah. Do you know how we grow them? So oh, yeah. the way we grow Shady, them. If you... Water. <laughs> They're pretty interesting organisms. They don't need to be watered because they can take water out of the soil or out of the atmosphere. But um, the way we grow them is we take poo, either – cow manure, rabbit, uh, turkey, um, or goat, and we mix it with hay or some other grass, and we make a mat, and then we put the spores on top of that, and then we have these kind of these carts that have all these layers and layers of, of mushrooms growing on them, and we put them in a very damp, um, cool space, and we just let them grow. And then after about uh, four days, we go in and we can start to pick them. And we can pick them so that they their caps are still closed. We can pick them, their caps are open. We can pick them when they're large, we can pick them when they're small. You know, because people like different, they like them at different stages of development, right? They, they tend to think that certain stages of development are more tender. Uh, and then of course, the ones that are open have more mass to them. So it all depends, right? But most of these mushrooms that you buy at the, not the shiitake, not those, but um, the the ones that uh, are typically, you know, the the cap mushrooms or the button mushrooms, those things, they are grown on poo, and then they're cut, and they package them, and they sell them to you at HEB, right? And they're delicious, but they grow on poo. So the way that um, nutrients get converted into energy and tissue is quite interesting, right? So it's, even though they're growing in poo, you're not eating poo, you're eating the end products of breaking down the poo, right? And that's pretty cool to think about. So if you like mushrooms on your salad or your pizza or wherever, or your stir fry, um, that's the way we grow mushrooms and we can, we can grow a whole bunch of mushrooms. If you are a, if you are a person like me who likes to forage for mushrooms, I don't know if I've told you this, but um, I own a piece of property in Bastrop 
And the reason I bought that piece of property was to help to save some endangered species that are in Bastrop. And um, there's a little house on it. Um, but uh, more than anything, um, there are about 150 different species of mushroom that grow on that property. And some of them are delicious, like the chanterelles and things like that. Right. So I go foraging for my own mushrooms and um, I'll cook them up and eat them besides the ones I buy at HEB. Okay. Any questions about the acquisition of nutrients? Amanda, you good? Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's talk the about. Soma is autotropic. One more time. One more time. The stoma. It's autotrophic. No, the no, the stoma is how gas gets exchanged. But the stoma is the underneath of a leaf and the plants are autotrophic. Okay, Keon? Okay. Okay. All right, let's talk about classification and nomenclature. All right. We're getting to the point where we're getting to the end of our introduction and we're going to start talking about the cells. But I need you to know some things before we go there. Because in this course, we're going to be using genus and species a lot. And we're going to be using domains and kingdoms a lot. And so I need you to know those things already. Um, so if we think about nomenclature, that's the way we name things, right? Taxonomy is the way we put things in a class or we classify them. And then identification is how we make them unique. Okay. So um, when I was in college, right, in the late 80s and into the early 90s for my first time I went to college, um, this is the way I learned it, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, right? I think I told you that kings play chess on fine grain sand. That's the way I learned it, right? And in about eighth grade, but in college it came back. Right? But this was the beginning of my understanding of taxonomy. And we need to know this stuff so that we can communicate with each other, right? When we say E. coli to each other, what does that mean to you? When we say E. coli, Sheska, what does that mean to you? What does E. coli mean to you? It's a bacteria. It's a bacterium, right? Yeah. Does it mean anything else to you? Uh, it's not good. Makes you sick. Not go oh, is it always not good? Well, no, no, not all bacteria is not good, right? Okay, okay. But the E. coli specifically, is E. coli always bad? Uh, it seems kind of bad, <laughs> but I'm probably wrong. Okay. okay. How about it, Cindy? Is E. coli always bad? Well, I've heard, you know, that it's bad, <laughs> or okay, okay, isn't it so associated with like feces? Okay, well, 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 I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get a consensus here. Kiyong, is E. coli always bad? I uh, maybe some there is something good. That's why you're asking me. Oh, maybe. Oh, oh, maybe <laughs> he's predicting something. Oh, yeah, Jaylin. Oh, I'm glad you showed up. I was a little worried that you weren't going to come, right? So, e. coli used to re oh, oh, yeah, so it can be good stuff, too. Is it? Go ahead, somebody. Our, it's in our gut, in our digestion? It's in our gut. It's in our, it's on our skin, right? It's in our mouth. It's everywhere. So what I'm going to tell you is, for those of you all who were scared of E. coli, less than 1% of all E. coli are dangerous. The other 99% are what we call commensals. Anybody ever heard of that term? I know Amanda has because she had me for 1308. They're commensals, right? Uh, oh boy, I misspelled it. They're commensals. Anybody ever heard of that term, commensals? That means they live with us. No. No. Okay, that's okay, that's okay. Claudia, that means they live with us but don't cause us any danger, right? Don't cause any harm. Commensal, right? So almost all the cells that live on our skin or in our intestinal tract are commensals. They, 
in some cases, they do some good for us, right? Uh, in this case, they take up space and they compete for nutrients with other organisms that might cause us bad or, or infection. And so in this case, they're good for us, right? But they don't really cause us any damage unless they get into what we would consider a sterile site in the body, like the urinary tract, right? Any E. coli that gets into the urinary tract is going to cause cystitis or bladder infection. But that's any bacterium. That's not just E. coli. E. coli just happens to be the number one organism that causes urinary tract infections. And we see more urinary tract infections in females than we do males, right? So not most E. coli is not bad, right? So the reason we want to talk about this is so that we understand that when we talk about E. coli, that, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, right? Where if we just say it's a gut bacterium, that doesn't really tell us anything. But if we say it's E. coli, sometimes it can be bad, but most of the time it's good. But if we say salmonella, that's a whole different organism, right? That one's mostly bad. Are you with me? So we want to understand how we do this. Classification at taxonomy all started with this guy right here, Carolus Linnaeus. Be sure you know him. He was the first guy to think about putting things in groups. So he famously said, because it was all observational, right? They didn't have any microscopes back then. And so it was either he looked at him and he said they're green and they're a plant or they move around or they have some movement and they're animals, right? Um, so he said everything's either a plant or an animal. That's the, that was the start of the whole taxonomy. But he's not famous for that. What he's famous for are his binomial nomenclature, right? Yeah, he was an observational scientist. But because he could observe things, he started to name things, right? And he put things in what we call a scientific name, right? So E. coli – what does anybody know what the E stands for? Does anybody know what the E stands for in E. coli? Escherichia? <laughs> close right. enough. Close <laughs> enough. Close – it stands for Escherichia. Most people have never heard of that, but they've heard of E. coli. Okay. So the scientific name has a genus and a species. In the scientific name, the genus is always capitalized. And the species is always lowercase. Okay? So these are his rules that stand by even today. Okay? Good? Now, back then, to distinguish them, because they didn't have computers, they didn't even have typewriters, uh, they underlined them to basically say that they are very, very important terms. Right? Nowadays, the rules say that if you're handwriting them, you underline them. If you're putting them in typeset, right, using a word processor, you have to italicize them, OK? But this is what he came up with, the scientific name, the binomial nomenclature system. Binomial means two names. The scientific name is composed of two names, a genus and a species. You need to be able to recognize a genus and a species for me, OK, because we're going to talk about a bunch of them, OK? But he was the guy who started it all. He said things are either plants or animals, OK? So then lots of other changes happen, right? We had a guy who was doing research, and he basically said there are five kingdoms. And the five kingdoms he proposed were everything bacteria, whether it was an archaea or a bacteria, he said it belonged to the kingdom prokaryote. Now think about this for a minute. He put all the bacteria, whether they were whether they were archaea or bacteria, he put them into this group, right? Then he said things were protista, they were fungi, they were plants, and they were animalia. So Amanda, would you agree with me that he was putting an emphasis on 
the eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with me? I would. Okay. So everything that I just put in this little box is a eukaryote. The only thing that's a prokaryote is what he called prokaryote, right? And he was using the three M's as a means to put these into groups. The three M's, the first one is morphology. So Dana, what is morphology? Okay. Um, Jaylin, what is morphology? She's being shy today. Usually she wants. Is to that the work. study of how things form? No, no. Oh, Natalie, thank you. How things form, uh, shape and structure, shape and structure. Okay, good, Cindy. Thank you. Sure. The second M stands for metabolism. Right, and that's not only what organisms consume, but what they produce as an end product. Okay, and the third M are the molecular techniques. So that is looking at the types of proteins things produce, that's looking at the DNA sequencing, the types of fatty acids that they produce, that kind of stuff. Okay? So this is what what Whitaker, what Robert Whitaker basically did was he put them into these groups, these kingdoms, kind of concentrating on the eukaryotes, because that's what people were studying, right? They were studying the big organisms mostly. And he put them into different different categories, different kingdoms, if you will, by morphology and metabolism. Molecular, molecular techniques came a little bit later. Okay, but but that was part of it, diagnostics. Okay, good. So that stayed for a while, right? And so you can see we started to put things together, right? Um, we still didn't have that upper, that upper part of the hierarchy. Does anybody remember what that upper part of the hierarchy is? You might have heard of it before. Anybody ever heard of it? A domain. That's right. That's right, Carolyn. That's right. So a domain goes here. Now, in the development of this hierarchy, we have domains now. But how did that become there? Because remember, Robert Whitaker said there are five kingdoms. He was really honing in on the eukaryotes, right? Well, um, again, we started to get smarter, right? We started to use physical characteristics, biochemical tests, serology was coming into play, right? We started to look at what was in the blood and what we could test for. We used viruses to help us identify things. And then the analysis of nucleic acids, specifically DNA, started to play a role, right? We had DNA fingerprinting, right? And unfortunately, DNA fingerprinting didn't become a big thing until the OJ Simpson trial, where I remember, um, being in college and I was at the student center and lots of people were running to the computer to look up what the heck DNA was because they didn't know what it was, right? So nobody knew what DNA was really until the OJ Simpson trial. That's the way I remember it, right? But now we know a lot about DNA, right? And so it stayed like that for a long time because Robert Whitaker said there were five kingdoms, right? And it was all based on the three M's, morphology, metabolism, and the molecular techniques, right? And then we started to think about the archaea being different than the bacteria, because they were different. As you know, the archaea are going to be found in very extreme conditions, right? Where the bacteria, back then known as the eubacteria, were going to be known to be, you know, the ones that we came in contact, the E. coli, the Staphylococcus aureus, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? And so my wife, I don't know if I told you this, my wife is a forensic scientist uh, who's trained classically in aquatics. And um, if you look her name up, you can find that she came up with a lot of different techniques and she worked for wildlife. She worked for Texas Parks and Wildlife. 
Um, and um, she retired when she was 48. She just got tired of going to court because in her mind, um, the lawyers were never interested in the truth. They were only interested in trying to make her make a mistake so they could get their clients off, right? So she got tired of that. And after 20 years, she basically said, uh, can I retire? I said, hell yeah, you put in your time. So she gardens and does things like that, helps other people, volunteer work, that kind of stuff now. But you couldn't get away from her, right? So if a game warden stopped you and found blood on the back of your truck or found a little bit of tissue on the back of your truck and said, well, what's this? And you say, well, you know, we slaughtered a hog a while back so that we could have a big um, cookout. They could take a little bit of, of that blood, even though it was old. They could take a little bit of that tissue, even though it was old, and they could send it to my wife. She would analyze it, and she could tell you what the genus and the species were of that organism. She could tell you how old the organism was, and she could tell you if it was male or female. So a lot of times with people who were poaching deer, when the game wardens basically said, well, we're going to send this to our forensics lab, they would just basically say, I did it, right? So my wife, just the fact that she was there um, made a lot of people confess to the crimes. But even now, you might have heard this in the news, that we can go back to de to blood, blood smears or semen or whatever that has been on clothing for 30 plus years. And we can take that and we can analyze it. And sometimes we can basically look at the person who got put away as a criminal and say yes or no to he really caught, he really, he really was the one who, who committed that crime. And in some cases we are exonerating, we're, we're saying people, we're really sorry, but we put the wrong person in jail. Uh, and so uh, you're free to go, although we ruined your life, right? Um, you know, if they spent 30 years in jail and now they're out, right? That's that's a whole different thing. But you, nowadays you cannot run away from science, right? Science is at the point now that it has a way to answer the question about who done it, right? As long as we have, as long as we have some samples. Okay. Along comes um, Carl Wise. So Carl Weiss, when I was in graduate school in the, in the early 90s, I went to a nerd conference and I heard him talk about his research, right? And I was fascinated. What he said was what we've been teaching and what we know to be true, that there's five kingdoms is not wrong. There are only three super kingdoms, okay? And he said those three super kingdoms are the U bacteria the archaea bacteria and everything else eukarya. And he said, and this is all based on ribosomal RNA, which is a very specific way that we can differentiate organisms, right? We didn't know that at the time, but we now know that, right? So 1990s, right? That's 10 years at 2000, 20 years at 2010, we're at 2021, that's 30 years ago. Now we're a lot smarter and we now know right, that, that there are really three super kingdoms. Well, we don't call them super kingdoms anymore, right? We call them domains. These became domains because as we, as Caroline or Car Carolina, Carolina, whatever you want to say that name, you'll have to, re you'll have to tell me how you want to be called, Miss um, Kursky, but um, she's already said they're the domains at the top of the hierarchy. And the, th and the three domains are based on the work of Carl Weiss, who basically said there were three super kingdoms and nobody believed them, right? Because it takes a long time for scientists to all come in agreement to something, right? But it wasn't until this other guy, Fox, came along and said, you know, I've been doing kind of the same research that Carl Weiss has been doing. And I can tell you, that his research is correct, right? So people started to, okay, here's another set of 30 years of data that basically says this the way it is. And so um, other people started doing research. And remember when, when science changes because there's a mountain of data that basically says this is the way it is. And what we knew 
to be true before is changing because our ability to analyze data is changing, right? We didn't have, when Robert Whitaker set their five kingdoms, we didn't have really a lot of molecular techniques. So it was mostly observational, right? Therefore, it was mostly, as Amanda said, it was mostly centered around the eukaryotic organisms and the prokaryotic organisms, eh, we didn't pay too much attention to them, right? Cheska, we didn't pay too much attention to E. coli. Are you um, okay, yes. So you're saying that we no longer follow the, um, the older school um, uh, different uh, kingdoms? We now have we to follow the three or we, we do, do all of it? No, no, we do. But we've incorporated what Carl Weiss and, what Carl Weiss and, and Fox said, right? Okay. So okay. we put, we put, what um where is it i missed it oh no okay excuse me one second i'm going here. we put the super kingdoms up here but we don't call them super kingdoms we call them domains and that's how that's how the domains that's how the super kingdoms the work of carl wise and fox got incorporated into the hierarchy so we still use this. For the scope of this course, you need to know the domains and the kingdoms, and you need to know the genus and species, or at least you'll need to be able to identify those. The other stuff in between is important for somebody like me, but not for you all, okay? So let's talk about those, right? So we then incorporated the domains. So you can see the domains here. So the domains are the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya, and then, I believe, that's why this image is here, that underneath the eukarya, there are four kingdoms. So if you take a look at this image right here, right, you can see that this was the beginning of our understanding about how organisms are related to each other, right? That science of how things are related to each other is called phylogeny. phylogeny okay but if you look at it look at that image the way our classification system is now put together miss cheska is uh went the wrong way sorry is that we have three domains the three domains are the bacteria and there are the archaea And they are the eukarya. What does the EU stand for? The EU for you bacteria. I guess that's what you mean. Is that right? oh oh oh? You mean in, yeah, in eukarya? Yeah, for any of them. Yeah, well, okay. any of them. Me, right. Is it means the same it all? means the it it means the new guys. That's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it, it it means the ones with it means the ones the new guys. But in this case, it with eukaryotic, right? It means mm -hmm. those with a nucleus, okay? Uh, New. Underneath the eukarya are the kingdoms. And can you all tell me what the names of the kingdoms are? I'll give you the hard one. Protista. Kiong, protista are single-celled nucleated organisms, right? The second group are the fungi. The third group are the easiest one of them all, the plants. And the fourth group are the ones that most people are interested in because that's where we fall. Animalia, okay? And so this is what the classification system looks like now, right? Domains first. then followed by the kingdoms. Okay, good. Everybody with me? Yes. 
All right. So if we think about that for just a minute, oops, um, it all turns in, it all allows us to understand how organisms are put into groups, right? So if we go back real quickly, and so just, just think about this for a minute. When we assign scientific names, when we use the binomial nomenclature system, we give a genus and a species, right? So now check this out. This is Staphylococcus aureus growing on a plate. Can everybody see that? Everybody see that? Yes. What color is the organism? What color is, what is this little round thing called? What is that little round thing called? The Petri dish? Chester. Oh, the Petri, okay. But what about the little round things on the Petri dish? Mycelia? Not mycelia. There's the C, the C <laughs> and the CFU. Do you remember? A colony. Thank you, Kayla. A colony. Right. So, what color is a colony, Kayla? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? What color is the colony? A cream or yellowish color. Oh, okay. Would you would you be okay if I said golden? Would you can you agree with that? It's golden. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Okay. That's what aureus means, golden. Right? Now let's look at the if we do a, a we do a, a gram stain of it, can you all see the round spheres on here? What are those spheres called? What are those round spheres called? Anybody remember? They're called coxy, right? And if they're in clusters like this, then they are, the, the Greek word for clusters are estaflo, right? And so this is the scientific name, Staphylococcus aureus. And what it means is, as a colony, this organism is golden, but if you do, if you put it under a microscope, it clusters up and it's coxy. So that scientific name makes a lot of sense now. Are you with me? And that's the way we name things. Okay. Hey, Cheska, E. coli. Yes. Yes. We're going back to that guy, you remember? Yes. And it means Escherichia, right? Escherichia, got it. Uh -huh. And it's named after Dr. Escherich, who first described it from being recovered from the intestinal tract of mammals, right? Yeah, got it. So it was named after him. Escherich got turned into Escherichia, right? And coli denotes that it came from the intestinal tract of mammals. Are you with me? Specifically mammals. Mammals. Well, it can be found in other organisms, but that's where they first recovered it. Okay? Okay, got it. Good. All right. So if we think about that, then you can see that now Staphylococcus aureus is much more important, right? It causes all kinds of infections, and it's resistant to a lot of antibiotics. Right? You all may have heard of MRSA. Right. MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. You okay? Is she okay? Are you okay, honey? Hey, Cindy, your mic's on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. So, again, if you think about those colonies growing on this plate, you can see that they're golden, right? And then you can see that they're in irregular clusters, right? That's how it got its name. All right. Now, phylogeny, I just talked about. That is how everything is related, right? Everything on this planet, whether it is here now or was here in the past, is related to all life, right? Phylogeny is the study of how everything on this planet is related to each other, whether it's here now or it was here before, how it's related to what's here now. And evolution is the study of 
the history of life on this planet. Evolution does not evolution does not explain the origins of life. It explains life once it's here. Okay? So there are two preconceptions about evolution. Number one, that all new species originate from a pre-existing species, right? So I don't know if you've ever seen the dog shows, but a lot of times they'll introduce a new species. They'll call it a breed, but it's a species. They'll call it a new species of dog. And that what, what happened there is you had two different breeds um, have sex and you came up with a different organism, right? All species originate from a pre-existing species. And closely related organisms have similar features because they evolved from a common ancestor. So for those individuals who tell you that humans evolved from apes, it's not at all true. We evolved from a common ancestor. So we have a common ancestor with the apes, but we did not evolve from apes. Okay? So this is science, right? It's not political. It's not theological. It's science. Science has never said that we evolved from apes. And evolution has never said how life started on the planet. Evolution talks about life once it's here. And phylogeny explains how things that are on this planet, whether they're here now or were here before, are related to each other. Now, Cheska, I'm about to blow your mind. If you have never seen this before, I would like you already saw it. I'm excited. <laughs> OK, this is an older phylogenetic tree, right? This is the new one. It was published about eight years ago. Now, Amanda, you said that Whitaker's work really focused in on the eukaryotes. Are you still under that particular train of thought, of Miss Amanda? Did Amanda leave me? Keon, let's take up in Amanda's place. Would you say that the work done by Robert Whitaker was really focused in on the eukaryotes. Would you say that? Yes. Okay, I agree. Okay, now check it out. Are you ready? Get ready, Cheska. Here it goes. All of this stuff on the phylogenetic tree that was just published about eight years ago, these things are the bacteria. Good? These things. All of those things. All of those things. These things. Miss Cheska, or the or the archaea, are you with me? And yes. these things down here are the new kids on the block. They are the eukarya, and humans are right here in a group with the fungi because those are our closest relatives. In this in this taxonomical group called right. So, Cheska, would you like to maybe change what the focus of the speciation and the variety and the diversity of life on the planet is it focused on the eukaryotes or is it focused on the prokaryotes? Well, I would certainly support prokaryotes just because of... It's definitely. So because many. the bacteria, these, these guys, the bacteria are prokaryotic. These guys, the archaea, are prokaryotic. And these guys over here are the only things that are eukaryotic. So really, we're very new to the world. Right, compared to the history of the world, which is millions of years old. Now, here's the other thing that's going to blow people's minds. Miss Cindy, if you're there, um, what did eukaryotic cells evolve from? I believe Cindy left. Oh, Cindy left. Okay. Uh, okay, so Cheska, 
where did eukaryotic cells evolve from? Um, where, do, where do they have common ancestry with something else? There are other multicellular. Um, well, we're multicellular. Mm, we are multicellular, but our cells derive from right here. And so what's our common ancestor? Wait, what did you Jessica. point to? I, I put a little dot. Do you see a little oh, dot? Oh, the little blue here? dot, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do we have a relationship with? So you're, are you saying like other prokaryotes or oh, archaea? No, no. <laughs> look, look, I like the archaea. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> our cells derive from an archaea. Isn't that interesting? Now people are going to go all crazy on me. They're going to say, wait, Proving, you said we just, we, you said, you blew my mind when you said we didn't evolve from the apes. I said that. But now you're saying we evolved from an archaea? I said that also. But it's here. It's science. Okay? It's not political. It's not theological. It's science. It's been proven. This is theory. Scientific theory means it's been proven and there's a mountain of evidence that supports it. Everyday theory is a guess, right? If you have a theory about who the bachelorette is going to pick, it's a guess. It's not, it is not supported by any evidence. It's a guess. Scientific theory is supported by a mountain of evidence. It's called a theory because it can change. Because look where we started, Cheska. We started with Linnea saying there's a plant and an animal, right, to where we are now right this is an old phylogenetic tree that really looks weird to me this is the new one right it's a theory because as we get more data right back when Whitaker was talking we didn't have a lot of the molecular techniques the, mo the, the molecular techniques now are so advanced you cannot hide from science right so now we have a lot better ways to examine and analyze stuff so now we can see where things are really related okay is there any questions about anything we talked about right we finished the introduction be sure you know the be sure you know the um the things that Linnaeus did be sure you know the things that the achievements are, are, are what, what Whitaker did. And then be sure you know the basis of the domain system of what Carl Weiss and George Fox did. Okay? Any questions? We are done with the introduction. It's time to start to talk about cells. But before we can talk about cells, we have to talk about the tools that we use in order to study them, right? And so this is really good because hopefully we do go get to go back to the lab in two weeks. And when we go back to the lab, we're gonna use all these tools that we're gonna talk about today, right? We're gonna start with bacteria because their shapes are real easy to study, where the shapes of eukaryotic cells are very much more complicated, and so they're harder to study. So we're gonna start with the bacteria. And this is a bacterial cell, and these are all the parts of the bacterial cell. They're very simple in design, uh, but even then they have all these weapons, right? So we're gonna talk about the fimbri, right? The fimbri are these, these hair-like structures that are coming out of the cell. Not all bacteria have them, but those that do, they use these fimbri as attachment. We're going to talk about inclusion bodies. Inclusion bodies are mostly vacuoles where they store things, right? Um, we're going to talk about the cell walls because that's how we differentiate them, right? We're going to talk about the plasma membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane or the cell membrane, right? Because that's how they interact with the environment. We're going to talk about outer membranes, but outer membranes are only going to be found on gram-negative cells. And so, um, Carolina, what 
do we know about gram-negative cells right now? Maybe she left me, I don't know. Claudia, what do we know about gram-negative cells right now? Anybody can answer. They turn oh, red, right? They're, they're red. If you stain them, they're red, right? That's all we know about them, right? That's, but we're going to learn a lot more about them. We're going to talk about endospores. Endospores are only produced by gram-positive organisms, and they are a way that the cell can go dormant, right? We're going to talk about the cytoplasm. We're going to talk about the structures of locomotion for the bacteria, uh, and they are flagella or axofilaments, we'll talk about them. We're gonna talk about the cytoskeleton. We're gonna talk about the ribosomes, right, and what they do. And the ribosomes and bacteria are free floating in the cytoplasm where the ribosomes and eukaryotic cells are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Right? We're gonna talk about the pilus. The pilus is the way that organisms, gram-negative organisms only, right, are the way that gram-negative organisms share DNA, right? So if you look at this structure here, this is called the nucleoid because it resembles a nucleus, but it's not a nucleus. It's the chromosome of bacteria. They have one chromosome, right? This other thing here is called plasmid DNA. It's extra chromosomal, and that can be shared with other gram-negative bacteria. And then we're going to look at glycocalyces. Glycocalyces are extensions of the cell walls that allow these organisms to have a competitive advantage in an environment that is competitive. And if you think about the bacteria, Cheska, um, we are very interested in one competitive environment, and that's the human body, right? So when these organisms get into our body, Usually they don't last very long because our immune system gets rid of them pretty quickly. But those that can cause infection in our body, cause infection in our body because they overtax or overburden the immune system of the body and therefore they cause infection. Okay, whether it is a bacterium, a virus, a yeast, a mold, a parasite, the reason that they cause infection in our body is because they either hide from the immune system or they weaken the immune system or they just completely outnumber the immune system. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. That's where we're headed. But before we go there, we have to talk about tools. And the three tools that we're going to talk about are morphology. You guys... You all already know what that is, morphology, study of shape and structure. We're going to look at microscopy, microscopes, and then we're going to look at staining, right? And then we're going to start to talk about cells, okay? So when we start, we start with bacteria because they're easy. There are three shapes, right? There's a coccus. You guys might know this already. They're round structures. There's bacillus, and the bacillus are elongated structures. Right. And then there's spirilli. Now, the spirilli, the spirillum, they sometimes look like an S. They sometimes look like those birds you used to draw when you were in uh, grade school. And sometimes they are elongated and tightly helically coiled like this. Okay? We call those spirochetes. These other things, these other names, a cacobacillus, is kind of a short but oval organism so it's elongated but it's not it's not a perfectly round structure like a coccus and vibrio are organisms that have a bend in them they're curved they used to be known as a comma bacilli right and so they look like that okay and pleomorphic means that it's got many shapes okay so now check it out here are the three shapes of bacteria Right. I think you can all say that this is a spiral. It looks like a spiral. I think you can all say that this is a rod or a bacillus, right? But what about the coxy? Do they look perfectly round? Do they look perfectly round? 
No. No. Not all of them. And yeah, and that's because they're distorted. And the reason they're distorted is because they're interact they're interacting with the dyes that we use to stain them. And the dyes are interacting with the cell wall and it distorts the cells. So it mostly distorts the coxy. It can distort the other ones also, but mostly it's the coxy that we just we see distortion in. Okay? So the three shapes of bacteria are coccus or coxy for plural, bacillus or bacilli for plural, and a spirillum or spirilli for plural. Okay? Now, when we look at morphology, we're also looking at arrangement, how they are arranged. And so coxy can be single, they can be in pairs, right? They can be in tetrads, and tetrads are groups of four. That's why it's called a tetrad. There's groups of fours, right? They can be in irregular clusters, right? So irregular clusters come from the Greek word staphylo or staphyl, which means clusters, right? And so we already talked about staphylococcus, its cells are in clusters, right? Irregular clusters, right? So that they look like, if you will, grapes, right? So if, if you were to use your imagination, you could see a stem coming out here with a leaf, right? And so then you might say that those are grapes on a on a stem. Yep. So uh, they can also be in chains, right? And the chains come from the Greek word strepto, right? And so you have chains. Now some individuals will say that a diplococcus is nothing more than a short chain, right? Which I kind of agree with that, but it's the way it is, okay? So streptostaphylo, and diplo. And those three arrangements are really important, right? So if you understand, if you understand arrangements and you understand the way things stain, you can know what type of organism it is, then you can use that as a tool, right? To help you to diagnose things, right? And so in just a minute, I'll make that distinction. I'm gonna put things together for you all, okay? So you can see with the coxy, there's morphology and there's arrangement. With the bacilli, there is there is the shape, the morphology. Bacilli can be found as a single, right? They can be found as a diplo. They can be found in chains, right? So this would be a streptobacillus, right? But those things really do not offer us a lot of help diagnostically. The only thing that will is if they're found side by side and what we call palisades, right? And so sometimes they arrange this way. They're growing right next to each other and they're attracted to each other because of a type of cell wall they have. It has a different type of a wax in it, right? And so this is really important um, when we're dealing with, especially lungs, and we we take a bronchlavage or biopsy, and we look at it and we see these palisade bacilli in it, it is a diagnostic tool for us to help us diagnose tuberculosis, okay? But only tuberculosis. The, the arrangement in bacilli don't help us a lot more than that. Okay, questions. I don't have a slide for the spirilli because the spirilli are loners. They never form any kind of association. If you find them in groups, you just got lucky, right? They never form any kind of a, they're loners, okay? And therefore, they're 
their morphology is helpful because we can say, oh, they've got the symptomology of having Lyme disease. It's probably Lyme disease. Let's check it out, right? But other than that, they don't give us any kind of clue about what that is. Therefore, I don't have a slide for them because they're just not important from a morphological or arrangement perspective, okay? The microscopes are important, right? We have a simple, we have a compound, and we have an electron. So simple microscopes are nothing more than a magnifying glass. They can magnify things anywhere from two times to about maybe, maybe 20 times, depending, depending on what type of magnifying glass you have, right? These are really important to look at morphology of large structures, right? Or if you are a collector of like I am a foreign currency, or some people might collect stamps, or some people might collect coins, right? You can use a magnifying glass to help you study those things and really see the beautiful artwork. The, the money of other countries is beautiful, but um, I like to I like to collect them. And so any place I go anywhere, I collect one, and my friends go someplace, they bring me a $1, whatever, um, from that country, okay? At Michael's or at other places like that, Hobby Lobby, you might be able to buy this little cube. It's got six sides to it. And this little cube, every single side has a different magnification. And so you can open up one side of that cube and you can put an insect or a plant or whatever, a piece of wood, and then you can turn the cube around and you can see this, whatever you're looking at, at from a different perspective at a different magnification. It's a beautiful thing to... Uh, get students involved with or kiddos because they can spend hours looking at an ant, right? That's pretty cool to think about, right? A compound microscope is the ones that we will use in the lab. We've talked about them already in the lab. And a compound microscope has two different lenses, right? It has the eyepieces or the oculars, right? They have a magnification of 10 times. And then it has the objectives. And the objectives, depending on which one they are, they can have a magnification power of four times, of 10 times, of 40 times, or of 100 times, right? And to get the total magnification for the field of view that you are looking at, you have to multiply the objective by the eyepiece and then you get the total magnification so 40 40 x 100 x 400 x 1000 x and 1000 x the oil immersion lens is what we will use to look at bacteria because they're so small okay the electron microscope um is really important and it has allowed us to do a lot of really cool things with studying microorganisms specifically right and there are two types of electron microscopes, right? There's an SEM, which stands for Scanning Electron Microscope. And it's used for surfaces and topography, right? Curvatures of whatever you're looking at. Uh, and then there's a TEM, a Transmission Electron Microscope. A Transmission Electron Microscope is so strong. The ones that I used back in the day could magnify things up to 100,000 times. Nowadays, I know UT's got a really specialized one, and they can magnify things up to a million times the size you're looking at. It's an amazing thing, right? And so an SEM, right, a scanning electron microscope, can magnify things up to about maybe 5,000 or 10,000 times. A lot of our semiconductor companies, like applied materials um, or things like that, have scanning electron microscopes because what they do is they look at their chips to make sure that there are no cracks or fractures in their chips, because if they are, then they're not going to work, right? But they have different applications, right? So if we look at the scanning electron microscope, remember, it's for really surfaces or topography, okay? And so here is a bacterium on a filter. So you can see the filter, the nominal pore size of the filter, those little holes are about 0.2 microns, and so you can you can see the bacterium is being held back by them, right? 
a lot of times when we do electron microscopy work, it's always going to be grayscale. You're going to see kind of variations of gray and dark, but we can enhance them to make them look better so that we can put them in publications or in textbooks. And it makes them so that people can really um, visualize them and see how beautiful these things are. So this is a paramecium, which we're going to study today in lab. And this is an algae. Look at the geometrical designs on that particular algae. It's beautiful. You can't get that perfect unless you're one of nature's designs, right? This is the um, reproductive organ of a female fly. Now, you've seen flies before, but you maybe never really thought about the fact that they have reproductive organs, and you might never think about the fly the same way ever again, right? But the, the application for the scanning electron microscope, you can look at sperm on the surface of an ova. You can look at ova with a chorionic membrane still attached. You can look at lung cells, which is this right here. You can look at white blood cells attaching to non-self to things that don't belong in the body, right? Here's a really cool one. Here's blood. Again, they're usually grayscale, but we can computer enhance them by putting color in them so that people want to see them. And this is the fiber network that is formed, the nets that are formed, if you will, neutrophil, extracellular traps, and nets that are, that are formed when there is stuff in the body that doesn't belong there. Our body produces this fiber network like the spider whip. It captures the microbes, and then the white blood cells can come and destroy them. Right? Isn't that cool? And then you have a taste bud. You may never, ever think about your tongue ever the same way. And then this is a biofilm. Right? This is millions of bacteria of all different species all working together. For instance, in your mouth, on your teeth, right? Gathering nutrients, communicating with each other. They're an amazing, they're an amazing organism. Uh, I can't wait for you to really get to study them. Okay. That's those are all SEMs. Let's look at TEMs, transmission electron microscope. Right, the ones I use in the day. Uh, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, 30 years ago, uh, only could go up to 100,000 times. Right now, nowadays they can go. But here you can see viruses and you can see proteins and you can see <clears throat> inside of cells, right? They're pretty big. You would need a fairly large room to house them, right? This is an older one, but they have. it has to be a room that is vibration proof and soundproof because they're so sensitive that you could bump, you could cause them to break just by all the vibration, right? But look at what you can do with them. You can look at, this is influenza virus, right? This is a eukaryotic cell, and this is the nucleus right there, right? Pretty cool. Look at all the other internal structures, right? So if you look at the cells colored, right, you can't really tell any difference. But if you look at them through a transmission electron microscope, it's different, right? Or if you look at under a compound scope, you can not, you will not be able to see any of these structures. <clears throat> but if you look at it under electron microscope, you can see all these structures, right? Computer enhanced, this is influenza virus, and this is Ebola right here, right? This is Ebola, right? This is chloroplast, right, in grayscale, and this is chloroplast that has been color enhanced, right? You can see the grana and the thalakoids in it, and that's the place where photosynthesis occurs. That's pretty cool. And then this next image, this is rabies virus, which is one of the most dangerous viruses on this planet, right? Almost nobody survives it if they get it. And then this is one of the most famous of all images. This was published, I think, in 1982. It is the first time that we got to see the HIV virus, right? Again, Time Magazine bought this from the French. The French were the first group of individuals to isolate and photograph 
the HIV virus. So the pink thing that you're looking at is a, is a T4 helper, and the little green images are the virus. Look how small they are, right? And so Time bought it, bought the rights to the image. They color enhanced it. They put it on the cover of their magazine, and their magazine broke records, right? Because everybody wanted to know what people knew about HIV at the time. Nowadays, I have a copy of that magazine. But nowadays, if you read that magazine, you're like, man, this is old school. We know so much more about it. All right? And that's true. OK. Are there any questions about morphology or microscopy? Any questions? So the video that you had um, posted for us were the, um, were all, I think it was back, well, I don't really know, the organisms that were kind of floating around and the person did the photography. Was that something uh -huh. similar to all this? Uh, not, no, not really, because um, those are either, I think, probably prokaryotic or eukaryotic. So they're, they're really different. They're, they're much larger than these organisms, okay. than these infectious agents. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, so. Do we have to know all the pictures and names? Uh, absolutely not. I'm showing you these key on to make a point, right? To show you how okay. these tools are applied, okay? Good. So, staining is important. So I want you to write this down, key on. Write this down. The cell walls of bacteria are acidic by nature. And what does that mean, Keon? The cell walls of bacteria are acidic by nature. What does that mean? Uh, that means, I don't know. <laughs> OK, let's, let's just say this, right? So if the cell walls of bacteria are acidic by nature, would you say their pH is less than seven? Would that be okay? Yes. Okay, good. That's a good definition then, right? So acidic means less than seven, right? Neutral means seven, and basic means greater than seven for pH, okay? So let's think about this for a minute. If you have an if you have bacteria that cell walls are acidic, um, if you use a basic dye, is the cell going to accept the dye or reject the dye? What do you think, Cheska? Jalen, what do you think? Uh, not not accept it. Would reject it, right? Not reject. It's going to accept it, right? Because it's so possible, usually, but it, it balances it. Oh, I'm sorry. One more time, Cheska. Because it would become like a pH balance with base. Yep, with that's base exactly balance. right. Okay. So bases and acids are attracted to each other because they form salts, right? And that's how they react with each other. But an acid and acid not going to be attracted to each other. Are you with me? So if you have an acidic cell wall, you use a basic dye. The basic dye is going to color the cell, but there might be distortion because of the interaction that's going on with the acidic cell wall and the basic dye. Now let's turn the let's turn the scenario different. If you have an acidic cell wall and you use an acidic dye, Cheska, is the acidic dye going to be accepted or rejected by the acidic cell wall? Rejected. Rejected. Very good. And so what's going to happen there is you're going to have the background of the slide get stained, but the cells are going to be clear against that dark background. And because there's no interaction between the acidic cell wall and the acidic dye, there's no distortion. Okay. Are you with me? So what I have just introduced to you is the simplest of all staining techniques that we call positive and negative stain. Positive stain, right, uses basic dyes. We call it also simple stain. And the cells get colored, right? Negative staining uses an acidic dye. And the background gets stained. 
but what you have is the clear morphology against that dark background. Now you need, Mr. Keong, you need to know the mechanisms of these dyes and how they work, right? So because the cell walls of bacteria are acidic, if you use a basic dye, the cell is going to be colored. But if you use an acidic dye, the background is going to be colored and you're going to see the shape of the cell against that dark background. But both of these, their application, application means is what are they used for, right? So if you see that word in on an exam or you see it on the practical, then it's about application means what is it used for? What's its purpose, okay? So let's look a little bit at these things, right? Simple stain, also known as a positive stain, right? Uses, uses a basic dye or a basic stain. And it colors the cells. Negative stain uses an acidic dye or an acidic stain, and it colors the background, okay? But again, you're looking at morphology only, right? So this is what we see, right? With the simple stain, you can see that the cells get colored. So, um, Jaylen, what is the what is the morphology and the arrangement of these organisms right here at this arrow? Cynthia? Miss Caroline, you haven't talked in a while. You're hiding from me. Right? Anybody? What's the morphology? Come on, you guys. There's this, this. They're coxy. Coxy. Very good. Coxy, and what's the arrangement? Streptococci. Strepto very good. So these are streptococci, right? See how you put everything together? Now, what about here? What about this area here? What are those? Still coxy, what's the arrangement? It's, it's, it's on our side. Um, they're clusters, right? What's the Greek word for clusters? Staphylo. Staphylococci. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very good. Simple stain. You can't tell anything more from that except shape and arrangement. Okay. Here's a negative stain. So tell me again, a negative stain is uses an acidic dye. The acidic dye is repelled by the acidic cell wall and you see a dark background and the morphology of the cell against that dark background. So this is one that we made at Riverside, right? Not very good, but good enough, right? So what's the morphology there? What's the morphology there? Spiral. 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 And this is one I borrowed from the web. And what is the morphology there? Bacillus. Bacillus. And what's the arrangement? That's good, Kayla. Bacillus. And what's the arrangement, Kayla? Strepto. Streptobacillus. Mm -hmm. Very good. You guys are putting things together for me. That's what I want, okay? Putting information together, applying it, right? But those are just real easy stains to do and all you can tell is morphology and all you can tell is arrangement. Differential stains are much more powerful. Differential stains employ more than one type of staining reagent and now you can differentiate different types of cells or you can differentiate different parts within a cell. And the most famous of all differentiation or of all differential stains is the Gram stain, okay? So what do we know about Gram stains right now? Um, somebody tell me, what do we know about Gram positive, Gram negative? What do we know about them? Gram positive or what color? 
red. Gram positive. Purple. Purple. Gram negative or red. Yeah. Okay. So if we think about that for a minute, gram positive or purple, gram negative or red. Okay. Now what I'm going to tell you is that there can be a gram positive caucus, which I'm okay if you just start calling them GPCs. P for positive, P for purple, that's correct. I'm okay if you just call them GPCs, right? There can be a GPB, gram positive bacilli. This little V like this means or, so there can be a gram positive rot. They're the same, okay, good. For gram negative cells, there can be, I'm gonna change the color here. That can be a gram negative coxy. That can be a gram negative bacilli, or that's also known as a gram negative rod. And there can be a gram negative spirilli. What's missing? What's missing? So on the I heard about right the spirilli side. on the left. Yeah. So there is no and can never be, never, 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 ever, ever. There can never be a gram positive spirilli. Because in order for the spirilli to show its shape, it would have to be flexible. Gram negative cells are flexible. Gram positive cells are rigid. They're very, very rigid, they're hard, and therefore there can never, ever, ever be a gram-positive spirilli, okay? Everybody with me? So you can start using GPC, GPB, GPR, you can use GNC, GNB, GNR, GNS. Those are how we talk in microbiology. I want you to start to talk like a budding microbiologist, right? So now here's a quizzy poo. Let's do it. So somebody tell me what the gram specificity and the morphology are for those organisms there. We always put gram specificity first, then we add morphology. So what's the gram specificity and the morphology of those organisms right there? Somebody be courageous and answer the question. Kayla, oh. or anybody. Look, oh, La Lakeisha's gonna play. Lakeisha, what's the gram specificity in the morphology? Um, like gram negative or gram positive? Gram negative, gram negative, okay, good. And what's the morphology? Um, Bacilli. <laughs> what you said. Bacilli, yeah. okay, good. All right, now, somebody be courageous. Tell me what the gram specificity and the morphology is for that organism there. The one in red or black? The one that the one that's purple. I I, I black and black. What is it? Would it be um, gram positive with the gram positive? Not, bacilli. but not bacilli, it's spherical, right? It's coccyx. Spherical. Oh, okay, okay, okay. They're round, okay, good. Now here's the really big question. What about on the right-hand side? What can you tell me? What is that? Kayla, what are you looking at? Look at it very closely. Look at the clues, right? Microbiology is like nursing, it's like dental hygiene, it's like surgical technology, it's like radio, it's like it's like working in sonography or or any kind of imaging because you have to use your judgment. It's a qualitative science, it's not quantitative. You have to use your judgment. So what are you looking at on the right hand side? 
Well, right off the bat, I know that it is gram positive. Okay, so somebody, let's see, Kayla, it says gram positive. Okay, good. Is it a bacterium, Kayla? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> it's not. Why isn't it a bacterium? What do you see? Well, I noticed it does have like a um, this a difference in like the way it it looks. I guess like the um, shape okay. of every finger a little abnormal. Okay. What do you see in my little circle with an arrow? What do you see there? Is that budding? It's budding. Oh my goodness, Lakeisha. Ooh. Put it all together. Lakeisha has earned one point for everybody on the first exam we poo today. If it's budding, Lakeisha, what is like, it? Uh, yeast. What is it? It's yeast, right? So don't let the staining techniques confuse you. You have to look at what the data is telling you. The other things you see are these elongated structures that are on this slide. And what do we call those elongated structures? Pseudohyphae. Pseudohyphae. So what is this organism? Canida albicans. Isn't that special? You guys are putting it together. What the way I would work, and this is, I don't expect this from you all, but first of all, if you look at these two images, you can see that the top one is a gram-positive coccus, and it's in the arrangement of a diplococci. The bottom one is a gram-negative coccy, and it's also a diplococci. So let's say that Dr. Kayla catches me in the hallway and says, hey, Provi, check this out. I took this from an 82-year-old uh, woman's uh, bronch lavage that we just cleaned out her lungs. Will you check it out? I think she's got pneumonia. Can you help me out? So I go back to the lab. I do a gram stain. I see all these neutrophils, which confirm bacteria, but I also see gram positive diplococci. I go back to Dr. Kayla. I said, I've confirmed the gram positive diplococci. And she might ask me, uh, what do you think? I said, well, I'm about 97% sure it's streptococcus pneumoniae. Now I say 97% because I haven't done a culture and sensitivity, right? What's a culture and sensitivity? What am I looking for when I do a culture and sensitivity? What am I looking? What does that mean, culture and sensitivity? What does that mean? Natalie, speak to me. Tell me. What does it mean? Um, what, um, what you're trying to diagnose and the cause, right? right so that, well, the cause is the, the culture. The sensitivity is what antibiotics will kill it. Are you with me? But now that Dr. Kayla has that information, my professional uh, guess, if you will, it's hypothesis, right? I told her, oh, I think it's streptococcus pneumoniae. The reason I say that is because it is a lung pathogen. It is normally found in adults and extremely dangerous in the elderly. And we see it a lot causing pneumonia in the elderly. So Dr. Kayla should start empirical treatment with an antibiotic that's going to get rid of streptococcus pneumonia. I then will go back to the lab and do my work to confirm that, right? So that we're all on the same page. And so we're helping our patient, right? But we got to hit start, okay? The bottom one shows gram-negative diplococci. So say, let's say that, um, uh, I don't know, Dr. Lakeisha looks at me and says, hey, Provey, I, I just um, examined an 18-year-old male and he's having a really hard, difficult time. I took this particular uh, exudate, and so she gives me a little vial that's got pus and blood in it. And she says, I took this exudate from the head of his penis. Will you tell me what you think? I'll go back to the lab. I see all these neutrophils. I see these gram-negative diplococci. I go back to Dr. Lakeisha, and she says, what you find? I said, I saw gram-negative diplococci. And she might say, well, what do you think? I say, I'm 99% sure it's Nasiria gonorrhea because it, there's only one thing that acts like that in the urogenital tract. Are you with me? I'm not 100% sure because I haven't done the culture and sensitivity, but I'm going to go back and do that. But I'm pretty sure, 99% sure. There's 1% I might be wrong, but I'm 99% sure that it's Nasiria gonorrhea, right? So 
Dr. Lakeisha can start empirical therapy on this patient to treat for gonorrhea, right? And then I'll come back the next day and I will confirm. I said, here it is. It's, a, it's, it's, it's what it is. And we have a day head start of getting our patient to feel better. As a matter of fact, by that second day, they're feeling much better, okay? That's what these tools, and that's how these tools are used by. And some of you all are gonna get so good at what you do, either a nurse, a dental hygienist, a surgical technologist, working working and imaging, and you're gonna get so good that the physicians are gonna ask for your opinion. And that's always a compliment when they ask for your opinion because not only do they trust you, but they know you understand. Here's the difference between gram positive and gram negative organisms. I'm gonna let you look at those on your own time. And then here's some of the different shapes that we can see, right? So it's not just all, it's not all just this or that, right? It's not binary. There's a lot of things that can go on, right? And so you have to be able to use these tools. Another example of a differential stain is what we call acid fast stain. And really, when we do acid fast staining, we're looking for a certain type of wax in the cell walls of some bacteria, right? And that I call mycolic acid, right? And so mycolic acid is the dye is designed so that it only is attracted to mycolic acid. And the dye is hot pink, right? It's fuchsia. And so when we use this, we mostly use it for the staining of tuberculosis, right? Especially in the lungs, but it can be in other tissues. Or we use it for a certain parasite that we call Cryptosporidium parvum, which we're gonna talk about today in lab. But when we do a lung sample and it has tuberculosis in it, this is what it looks like, right? So it's a diagnostic tool that we can use staining to help us to screen for tuberculosis. Now, I still need to do a culture insensitivity, right? But at least we know that it's probably TB. Okay, good. An endospore stain is a stain that, so both of those, gram stain and acid fast, differentiate different types of cells. An endospore stain will differentiate different parts of cells, right? An endospore and bacteria are um, structures that, can go dormant and then the, the cell can go dormant completely. But these endospores are resistant to heat and they're resistant to drying out and they're resistant to boiling. You can destroy them in an autoclave, but you won't destroy them if you boil them, okay? And that's because their outer covering is composed of dipicolonic acid. and calcium. And these two things together make this outer covering of the endospore very protective, right? And so an endospore stain will allow us to differentiate between the parent cell, which is red here, and the endospore, which is supposed to be green, but it looks blue-green here, right? But you can definitely see them. And why is this important? Well, because there are some major um, infectious agents that can cause a lot of disease, right? Endospore forming organisms are gram positive by nature. They produce things like anthrax, gangrene, tetanus, botulism, and if you are in a healthcare setting right now, they cause antibiotic associated diarrhea. The organism that causes that is known as Clostridium difficile. You all will know it as C. diff. Okay, again, diagnostics, right? tools that allow us to do work, right? The last slide for today is another special stain. And this one is called a capsule stain. It allows us to differentiate a capsule, right? A protective covering for the bacterium and the bacterium. What you'll notice here is a quiz, right? What you'll notice here is the background is stained, right? You can appreciate that by this area right here that's stained right here. But you also notice that the cell is stained. So if the cell is being stained and the background is being stained, we're employing different types of stains, right?
Based on pH, your choices are acidic, basic, or neutral. What type of stain, an acidic, and a basic, or a neutral stain, is staining the cell? What do you think? Somebody answer. So it's interacting with the cell and coloring the cell. What type of stain does that? Based on Negative? Acidic, basic. No, no, not no, so, no, no. Cheska. Sorry. It's either acidic, basic, or neutral. That's, that's right. That's right. Um, I'm acidic? Just gonna, I'm just going to guess. <laughs> yeah. Basic, basic, basic. <laughs> basic. Basic, very good, because a basic dye will interact with the acidic cell wall and stain the cell. What's staining, What based on pH, acidic, basic, or neutral, what's staining the background? Therefore, it's being rejected by the cell. What do you think? So if it's being rejected, the basic is being rejected from the, from nope. the background of the cell? Is nope. that what you were nope. saying? Nope. Would nope. it then now be acidic? It's acidic. That's correct. It's acidic, Claudia. That's correct. Because the acid cell wall rejects the acid stain, and therefore the background gets stained. But if you get the cell to stain, and you get the background to stain, you can see the capsule. You can see the protective layer that is protecting that cell as a clearing. You see that clearing around the bacterial cell? And that's the capsule. So you can see the application of biochemistry, chemistry, biology, micro, all these things coming together, right? And so it allows us to really understand these cells. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our lecture today. Are there any questions?